This is Bonjour Chai, the A Good Rabbi is Hard to Find edition. I'm Avi Fongwell in Montreal, and I'm here with Phoebe Maltabovi in Toronto. We are your frozen chosen. On today's show, we talk about the changing face of the Canadian rabbinate and the decline in the number of rabbis out there. Is there a connection? We'll talk to Rabbi Robin Fryer Bodzin to find out. And uh, we'll see what else is going on in the world of uh, academia, Judaism, how's Jewish Canada doing, all this and more coming up. Phoebe, what's new in your life? Uh, Hi, Avi. Let's see. Uh, Well, we don't have a kitchen. That's what's new in my life. And this is voluntarily. I was going to say, was there a pipe bomb? It's not a a disaster. It is no, no. There's nobody um, destroying the houses of contrarian Toronto colonists or whatever. No, Um, it's to put in a second toilet in this house, a powder room, if you will, to be euphemistic and polite about things. requires changing up the kitchen a bit uh, good luck um what's been what's been crossing your radar these days um well apart from looking up you know hot plates on amazon i would say uh i've been looking at this article the newest college admissions ploy paying to make your teen a peer-reviewed author this is in propublica by daniel golden by ProPublica also is listed as an author and uh, Kunal Purohit. And I am a little bit concerned that my four-year-old and one and a half-year-old are not yet peer-reviewed authors. How will they ever go to college in America? Not that they're necessarily doing that. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) tell me a bit more about this because like, is it, I'm guessing the peer review is kind of dubious at best and it's just yet another way to boost you know. Yes. Yeah, so, um, well, here's where I'll take the big step back and look at what this is about. So basically, U.S. college admissions um, had been very reliant on standardized tests, uh, specifically like the SATs, usually, or the ACT. Um, a bunch of Canadian high school students also go through this process. So it's not um, just an American thing, although obviously it's a whole bunch less expensive to send your kids to college in Canada. But in any case, um There's been this move away from these standardized tests in the name of equity, right? Because traditionally, like often these standardized tests, um, people from wealthier backgrounds, white students, whatever, will um, often Asian students will perform better on them. And that will be, you know, seen as especially high income students will perform better in these tests. So then in the name of equity, let's focus on something else. So what do colleges focus on instead? Things that are even more um, prone to this type of inequity, namely, certain families can spend a ton of money sort of padding their children's applications, resumes, whatever, um, with various things um, to make them more appealing as applicants. And one such thing is to make your teen indeed a peer reviewed author. So there are these special programs where parents can spend thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars um, to, uh, and it's not only parents in the States, it's, it's actually all over the world um, to kind of like, it, it's the, there, all these different programs, some more dubious than others, where um, they have mentors who kind of seem like they're deeper into academia than they are. They might be grad students just looking for extra money. Anyway, so the point is, it's not necessarily a hoax, but it's often a bit of a hoax. And the idea is how that it, a lot but, of money gets But how can it not this. be a hoax? Yeah. Who expects an 18-year-old to be a peer-reviewed author right. of like an academic journal? Right. So this is um, something I do know a bit about from my personal life, which is that my husband is a professor. Um, he did not have this sort of childhood where anything would like this would be plausible and he's certainly like he's not co-writing papers with like small children like that's not what peer-reviewed work is um yeah it doesn't entirely make sense i mean i think that basically it's that you need to distinguish yourself to get into college and a certain number of children are going to be prodigies right and that exists but a much greater number want to show that they're prodigies on their college applications. Yeah. I, I don't know. I have so, I have thoughts. I have thoughts. Um, (laughs) Primarily like my first one is, you know, what, what happens when, you know, the entire academia, right. Is focused on making sure that everybody is elite. 
right? What, you know, what's the old uh, Lake Wobegon line where all the children are above average? Above average, right? right. All the children. And, and at some point, you know, why can't we accept that our kid is going to get into a good college, get a good education, get a, you know, a good career and move on into like good enough and being good and the pressure that we have placed uh, societally. And I, I will point out that, you know, that that a big part of that is the Jewish community that, you know, that if you go to a serious Jewish day school, um, or one of these non Jewish schools that has a high proportion of Jewish students, um, because that is the type of prep school that it is, and I live amongst them here in West Mountain, Montreal, um, the pressure to get your kids to do so well to, to be so high achieving um, is is insane. Um, I saw it much more in the States than in Canada, thankfully. And I think that Canada does not have the same level of, you know, striving um, that America does. So Canada does not um, have this, right? Like, not really, not on the same level. We can ask, I mean, it, I'm curious, yeah. like, let's ask our listeners, send us an email, yes. bonjour at the cjn.ca. Tell us if you've had a different experience. Tell us what what it, uh, what your experience was. Tell if, you know, I want to hear, have you- Do you are, need a personal brand to go to McGill? Yeah, days? I don't know. I because don't, when I applied to McGill long ago, um, you did not. When I applied to McGill and Concordia, you needed a 65 average. And I think that like McGill unofficially needed like a 75 average from your high school grades in order to like get in because mm-hmm. even though officially it was 65, they wanted to like differentiate themselves. So people sort of knew that like if you had a 75, you can get into McGill. If you had a 65 only, you can get into Concordia. Like hmm. that does not exist at top level schools in, in, in the States. But anyways, no, no. Um, that kind of sort of in a backward sort of way leads me to my next discussion uh, to, to the piece that I, I, I've been focusing on, especially it came up because of the main conversation that we are going to be getting to soon enough. Also, there was a piece in the CJN a couple weeks ago, actually, uh, entitled New Incentive Program is offering families up to $100,000 to move to Ottawa and enroll in day school. Um, and it's about a program that uh, woman Stacy Goldstein is spearheading, uh, saying like, you know, Ottawa is a wonderful place to be. You should come check it out. Uh, and in fact, uh, the cost of living is so much lower. We actually do have day schools. And if you do move here, we will give you a financial incentive um, to move here and to send your kids to a Jewish day school. And, you know, I applaud these programs. I applaud. I, I actually love Ottawa. People ask people Can who I know me. Say that I have that Ottawa comes up in this context for me. There used to be when I was in high school, there were ads all over New York about how Ottawa was the Paris of Canada or something like this. And <laughs> maybe um, the Paris, Texas of, mine, of Canada. <laughs> her her parents literally went on vacation to Ottawa, I think, because of these ads. So um, it worked. They didn't move yeah. there permanently, but yeah. <laughs> I'm curious about I want to see those ads. Um, look, I love Ottawa, um, but I, I'm i curious about what happens when a community feels the only way that they can entice people is with financial incentive. Um, you know, there has to be other things to go to, to get to it. I, I, I don't know the answer because like I said, I do think that smaller Jewish living is a compelling thing to, to, to behold. Um, I lived in Ottawa for a little while. I have friends in Ottawa. I, I think it's a wonderful community. And I do think that all the things that they say, uh, are true, that the cost of living is lower. There is kosher, uh, stuff available and groceries and there is Jewish communities and there's multiple synagogues that one can go to. Um, and like I said, it's not expensive expensive to live in. Um, and it's a community and it feels friendly and warm. Uh, but people have decided that they want to live in big Jewish communities in big cities and people have moved away from these small towns. Um, and I don't know what the, how to make it feel, you know, more enticing, but they're trying and they're doing something interesting. Um, but clearly if you have to offer somebody hundred thousand dollars, it's not as enticing as you would otherwise think inherently. So I don't know. What, what are your thoughts on this? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I, I'm thinking about this as usual, uh, from the secular perspective. Mm -hmm. And I would say that I would not want to live somewhere without a lot of Jews and without just a lot of diversity generally. And I like living in Toronto because um, I don't feel like I walk down the street and people are like, what is this strange person? Let let us uh, investigate. You know, I'm just one of many people who are all different things, whatever. Um, so there's like a certain threshold of Jewish culture and just a certain threshold of lots of different cultures. So for me, that's an appeal of a big city. I have never been to Ottawa. I don't, off the top of my head, know, I, I know what it is. I don't know its population. <laughs> um, you know, things like that. Oh, God, they're going to ask me all of this on the Canadian citizenship test. And I'm going to be like, oh, 
ah. But um, the point is, I, I think, yes, definitely. But I, Avi, I definitely take your point about that. If you're offering somebody $100,000 to move to Ottawa, and that's like some of the very limited information I have about Ottawa currently, it does not make it sound more appealing. It makes it, of course, sound less appealing. Whereas before, I would I thought it was the Paris of Canada. But, <laughs> it just marketing works so well. They shouldn't be talking about that. They should be calling it the Jerusalem of Canada and telling everybody Jewish to move exactly. there. And then, of course, people are going to start moving there. But yes, so I, I believe in Ottawa. And I, I just, I don't, I don't have a lot of hope for people being offered the money. Uh, maybe we'll have them on and see how the program went on in, you know, in a year from now and mm-hmm. see, see what's that going on. But I'm curious about that. Let's uh, let's get on to our main topic. Um, we're going to be talking about rabbis in a minute and declining rabbi numbers, and I think that is related to the um, to think to what I just spoke about in terms of um, small towns and and because I think the rabbis don't have as many positions in small towns, and I'm sure we'll talk about that. Um, what's your experience? Because you know you like to champion the secular. If I asked you, like, what does a rabbi do in 2023, right, Phoebe? What what would your like assumptions or or, or guesses be about that? So I think of rabbis as being, you know, the Jewish clerics. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and, um, and it's often if you do the New York Times spelling bee game, rabbi is a good word um, oh, for okay. the letters. Um, I think of rabbis as being the people who lead congregations generally. That would be my assumption is what a rabbi does a rabbi because i i went to hebrew school when i was a kid and there would be you know the hebrew school teachers but there would also be the rabbi right and the rabbi would be yeah the person who is maybe maybe there's more than one rabbi whatever um i do not assume that a rabbi is necessarily any particular demographic when i was a kid one of our rabbis was a lesbian that's an out and this was so quite a while ago, this was in a um, reform synagogue in New York City. So, I mean, like, I don't have any particular assumption that a rabbi would be necessarily a man. I know that rabbis are not like Catholic priests and can have, you know, rabbis can have families, of course. Um, as for what rabbis do who are not um, in a synagogue most of the time, I assume they all have a podcast. Um I think every rabbi I know wishes they had a podcast, in all honesty. I think that this is such a, okay. you, know, you know, the joke about that, about like, what's what's the term that we use for like a, a, a like a, it's a herd of elephants and a school of fish and a pride of lions. A collective noun. A collective noun. Thank you. Um, so what is the collective noun for um, white males, right? It's a podcast. Right, right. Yes, I've heard this. I've heard this. Yes. And it's not rabbis anymore because especially in the liberal communities, uh Women are much more represented. Uh, we have a lot of diversity within that, but that's that's just the role. I'm going to bracket that. Um, I think that um, rabbis serve many, many functions, and fewer and fewer of them these days are within pulpits simply because um, the pulpit itself is in decline. Synagogues are often in decline, not individual synagogues, but the synagogue as a collective understanding of this is the center of Jewish life um, is moving into decline. You have rabbis who become scholars and residents within federations. Uh, you have rabbis that lead nonprofit organizations and take their vision you know, to, to the masses for what needs to be done. You have rabbis that are educators. There's a lot of rabbis that go specifically and say, I never want to be leading a pulpit. I want to be a head of school. I want to become a school administrator of a Jewish day school. Um, that's where I think I will have the mo- most impact. And so the diversity of what it means to be a rabbi, what you can do as a rabbi, um, has really, really spread beyond just having pulpit um, experience. Uh, and mm-hmm. I think that that's been both a blessing and I think oftentimes can potentially be a curse simply because um, with that you know, idea becomes the fact that like, well, I don't have to be a rabbi to be a school administrator. So maybe I'm not going to become a rabbi and I'm just going to go to like get a master of education or a PhD in education or school administration and not necessarily add the rabbi to that piece. If I'm Mm -hmm. going to, I have a great idea for Judaism and I think that this is the future of Judaism. You don't have to go to rabbinical school in order to go and lead the nonprofit in order to do that. You can, and people have done that in the past, but the rabbinate, um, while rabbis are filling these roles, you don't feel the need to have that rabbinate in order to have that. So I think that that's a serious part of the discussion that we're going to have uh, when we bring in uh, Rabbi Robin Fryer Bodzin to talk about this and more um, right after we hear from our sponsor. Are you in the market for a new watch or a special piece of jewelry? Are you looking for the perfect engagement ring to pop the question? 
Atelier Lou has all this and more. Eric and the team at Atelier Lou can craft a piece for you, or you can select from some of the exclusive designers that they offer. From a simple bangle to a statement necklace, Atelier Lou can make you or your loved ones sparkle. Located in the heart of Westmount in Montreal or online at atelierlou.com, visit Atelier Lou for your next watch or jewelry purchase. And when you do, make sure to use promo code BON18 for 10% off your next purchase. That's atelierlou.com. So uh, back in March, uh, an article appeared in Tablet Magazine called Wanted, More Rabbis. Uh, Non-Orthodox seminaries try to adapt to changing communal needs and shrinking enrollment. And it really struck me, and I've been thinking about it since then, um, because I couldn't figure out if really what we need is more rabbis or if there are too many rabbis out there. And so, um, you know, I really started pondering this. And as another school year draws to a close and we ponder another round of, you know, wither the rabbinical profession and what are we going to do with these graduates? And are there enough uh, coming in in September uh, into rabbinical schools to fill the roles that we may have or we may may not have? Um, You know, we decided it's time to revisit this discussion, right? Last year, we lamented the fact that Quebec was making it increasingly difficult to hire a rabbi in the province of Quebec because of language laws and various other things. And today we're wondering whether there is a shortage to begin with. What do we expect of our rabbis? What do they expect of the community? Uh, These are all questions that are pointing to a changing face of this type of leadership in the Jewish community and one we'd like to take a deeper look at. So with us to discuss this is Rabbi Robin Fryer-Bodzin, a rabbi at Beth Tzedek Congregation in Toronto and also a member of the Chancellor's Rabbinic Cabinet of the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. Rabbi Robin, welcome to Moshe Chai. So great to be here. Can you start um, without getting into the really long history, which I'm sure we'll touch on at some point over the the course of this discussion? What was the typical impetus for going to rabbinical school when you were going into rabbinical school, like amongst you, amongst your classmates? And what do you think it is today? Right? Why do you think people become rabbis in 2023 as opposed to you know decades before? Thanks for asking the question. I entered rabbinical school in the year 2000 after I had just completed my MSW at Wurzweiler School of Social Work. And while I was there, I studied the works of Abraham Joshua Heschel, who spoke about the importance of Shabbat. I read the works of Rav Soloveitchik, who comes from the Yeshiva University world, who speaks that inside of us, there's always a conflict between the person that wants their relationship with God and the person that wants to be the head of the corporation and the chair of the board. And I also read Mordechai Kaplan, the founder of the Reconstructionist movement, who speaks about Judaism as a civilization. And he created the JCC model, the shul with the pool model, and he believed in behaving and belonging. And there's a third B, a belief. That's right. That's the important one. And those three ideas entered my head and I realized, oh, I need to be a rabbi. Um, This all speaks to me deeply. When I was in rabbinical school, again, I entered in the year 2000 and I went to the Ziegler School of Rabbinic Studies in Los Angeles. At the time, at least at JTS, most of those people were movement kids. They grew up going to day school. They went to youth group. They went to Camp Ramah and they directly went to JTS after When I wanted to be a rabbi, I realized I needed to do something in a different environment. And it's really nice in California and Los Angeles. And I was really connected and deeply touched by the Torah of Rabbi Bradley Shavit Artson, who's still the dean there. And so I moved to L.A. for five years. That was my story. Um, The people at Ziegler at the time were not cookie cutter movement people. Uh, Lots of different backgrounds brought people out there. Nowadays it's not happening as much. We don't really have many people who grow up through, I'll at least speak for the conservative movement, through the movement and then say, okay, and now I'm going to be a rabbi. It could be because rabbis are getting a bad name out there. It could be because we hear what's going on, at least in in other world denominations and preachers in, in general or pastors are getting in trouble for doing the wrong thing. It could be because in many communities, rabbis are not well compensated. And maybe it could be because they've seen there's friends whose parents, at this point, mothers and fathers are never home. And maybe that's not something that they wanted. When you speak to young rabbis, though, actually, like into 
nowadays, right? What what are their what's the reasoning that you hear? Do you think that it's uh, the people that are going in are the same path that you went through, or is it really? Uh, are there other reasons? Is it is it less spiritual? Is it more communal professional? Um, right? I I I sit here and I look and like I said, I'm a rabbi as well, and I'm I'm married to somebody in the clergy in a pulpit position, and I'm not in a pulpit position, and I realize that there's a lot of people that say, you know, I don't need to be a rabbi to do these Jewish communal professional work, whether it's a school administrator, whether it's uh, nonprofit leadership. Um, and, you know, I, I, c- I could be a rabbi, but I don't have to um, on, on the one hand. So there are people that say they want to work in the community, but they don't need the rabbinate to do that. And then the flip side of that is the people that are going in and saying, yeah, I'm going to become a rabbi, but I, I, I don't want to be a pulpit rabbi. I just want to go and, you know, uh, to use the words of colleagues of mine, uh, rabbis are basically coming in to be activists which we hear of in a lot of other professions, but, but that that's, you know, part of it. And, and do you think that that face of the new young rabbis is changing? It's an interesting question. So I'm looking at it from a complete different other, other perspective. So I was in, in education. I was a Rav Beth Sefer, a rabbi in residence at a high school in Chicago, uh, which is where I met the Feingold. But I also spent a good six or eight years in leadership on the executive council of the rabbinical assembly. Uh, I stopped, I don't know, three or four years ago, just my term limit had ended. And at that time, we were going through a really strategic process of ensuring that when we, the Rabbinical Assembly, which is the organization of conservative rabbis, when we talk about our rabbis, we do not only focus on the pulpit. Because for so long, people thought rabbi synagogue, rabbi shul, that there's this con- connection. And now there is a huge huge concerted effort to reach out to chaplains or school educators or people who are in the military or people who are in hospice and hospitals and all also really reaching out to our entrepreneurial rabbis out there who are creating their own thing which is really attracting people so i hear the question you're asking but i really only know the answer from the other perspective which is at least at the professional organized level, we're really, really focusing on reaching all of our rabbis who are holding so many different places, including our retired rabbis who have so much wisdom to share, and especially those that retire earlier in life who need something to do and who can help others. Mm -hmm. Yeah. um, So this is really fascinating to me um, as somebody from yeah, very much outside this world, but I am more familiar with uh, academia I have a PhD in French. My husband's a professor. Um, that's sort of more a world I know. And I'm just wondering about the similarities and differences of um, these fields, because I'm thinking especially about the sort of a lot of discussion of alt act, like opportunities outside of being a professor for people with a PhD and how this is on the one hand, certainly true. Um, I have a PhD. I do things that relate to what I did my PhD in, but that are not being a professor that certainly exists. But then it's also it can be sort of a cover for people finding it really hard to find either a job or a job that pays a living wage, things like that. Um, And I'm just wondering, I guess, also partly sort of, do people who are ordained as rabbis generally find work um, related to that? Or like, how often do they not, I guess, is one thing I'm wondering. I am overemployed in family in family living and day to day stuff, but uh, but as a professional, I don't use my rabbinate nearly as often as I as I would otherwise. Right. So I had one year of underemployment, and it stank. Uh, it wasn't anything to do with my fault, you know, where the place I was changed direction, and it was you know pretty much a terrible year of my life. I you know, I went to the gym a lot that year, so I guess that was good. Uh, but then I found the right position. There's always going to be rabbis who are looking who can't find the right fit for them. I've been very fortunate that I found one fantastic fit for 10 years, and then I decided to leave there. And now I'm at Beth Zedek, which is a match made in heaven. Because I am a rabbi working in a congregation, I can do things like sign wedding licenses uh, through Ontario that otherwise people can't do unless they go through the hoops that are necessary to do that. When it comes to end of life, most people, especially in a community like Toronto that's very traditional, want a rabbi at that time. Uh, when people are going through family discord, disruption, strife, and maybe they still feel that there's a stigma going to therapy, 
those people will sit in my office with me because of the of the title rabbi, which goes back to, you know, sort of old school, that the rabbi was the Rebbe and was able to be there for everyone's problems um, and give a great sermon on, on Saturday morning and read from the Torah and, 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 and. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. I'm fascinated by this like big picture, as you're saying, and then going back to the history, because we, we've been talking before in, in the earlier segment uh, about small town Canada and how, you know, rabbis, we don't have communities in small towns anymore, that everybody really wants to be in the big cities. Um, and that as a result, I think there are fewer pulpits available. The number of synagogue positions is dwindling. Now, do you think that there is a relationship between the fact that there are fewer synagogue positions available and therefore rabbis are saying, no, 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 we're not just this. We are executive directors. We are chaplains. We are hospice people. We are in prisons. We are um, doing all of this other work. We have podcasts, right? Um, is there a relationship between those two? Or is it that because there are fewer rabbis wanting to be in pulpits, then they, you know, but still wanting the ra- the wisdom and uh, of being a rabbi to go into the other work that they're doing, um, that you now have fewer rabbis wanting to go to small towns, you have fewer rabbis wanting to be in small sh- communities, and p- every graduate of a rabbinical school who goes and says, I want a pulpit position, everybody, all of them want to be the superstar rabbis in the large synagogues. I'm not sure if that's true. I don't think everyone wants to be in a large synagogue. Um, I but never more and more of them do do, do I now than before. I would be at a synagogue that has close to 5,000 members that is growing and growing and growing exponentially every day. Um, we're in a place right now where we need to hire more rabbis. Again, we're in an urban center, but we're also in Toronto. OHIP's pretty darn good, too. Big fan. Uh, big fan. Big fan. Big, <laughs> trust me, I had a recent uh, medical situation. Huge fan. The, the issue is also that search committees really expect a lot from rabbis. They really, really, really expect a lot from rabbis. You know, there's the old story. They want them to be young but have 30 years experience. You know, all of those sorts of things. And it's really hard to find the right shidduch. It's really hard to, it's hard to find that right connection and the right person. Uh, it re- it's like dating to find the right one that has longevity for a, a long-term relationship. You just have to there get something some like a people. birthright bus and get everyone together. No, just right. There are some people who want small towns. Some of my, you know, some of my closest friends are rabbis in small towns and they're thriving and they love it. And yeah, they complain about kosher food or getting their kids to day school. But not everyone is urban. I'm urban. I've only lived in large cities. That's important to me. Uh, but that's not important to everybody. So I, I would say to generalize is is not giving some of our colleagues out there the kavod and the honor that they deserve for really putting in unbelievable hours, being away from their families, uh, never having a long weekend than it is for people like me who work in a large, massive synagogue with a huge team where we can all cover for each other and do we all have different tasks. Yeah, I, I get it. I, I I will take that and I'll accept that. Um, I you know I, I'm I'm somewhat humbled by that. By that, that I you know it's easy to to make pronouncements when you're not the one in the pulpit. Um, but you know I guess I was I call it like I see it, and maybe it is stereotypical. But but you're right. There are people that I don't see that are doing a lot of that great work, and I, I'm not there to call out my colleagues that are doing that great work, and and that's that. So for sure, um, shifting gears just a little bit, th- there has been a rise in online. Uh, rabbinic ordinations lately. Um, do you think that that is related to the devaluing of the rabbinic profession in young adults or or vice versa, that because there is so little, uh, so not as many people that are three, two, one, or is it the reverse that there are fewer people going into rabbinical schools and therefore there are people that want to make it as easy as possible and, and make it as friction free and say, hey, you can come learn it online and you can get your rabbinical ordination online. Uh, do you think there's a mix of the two? Uh, what, what, what are your thoughts on that? So my child uh, is now almost finished grade two. She did kindergarten and grade one on Zoom online. And it stank. My poor husband, you know, <laughs> he goes with her every day. She didn't learn how to read. Oh. You're supposed to do that. My my mother taught her how to read, right? Basic skill. Very hard to learn when you're on Zoom with a bunch of other people. I don't know how a rabbinical student can learn Talmud on Zoom when you're not face-to-face with your other person, where you can't get up and show the person in their Gemara, in their Talmud, what line it is, where you can't highlight the same things or write notes for each other and really have the energy that comes out of learning. 
that's so important. Everything about learning Talmud with a chavruta, with a study partner, it's not just about the words on the page. It's how to create a, a non-sexual intimate relationship with another person, which is so important in someone's rabbinate down the line um, in so many different ways. I don't know how that works online. I don't know what it's like to sit in a classroom as an adult where you're just looking at a screen. I think these online programs are, people are just going to be lacking basic skills that are really, really necessary. I think it is making it easier for some people so they don't have to uproot their families or, or wherever they have going for them and move to another city. I just feel that there's there's a Tom, there's a, I mean, how would you say Tom? There's a, a flavor, a general sense, they, the uh, a zeitgeist. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that you'll miss by doing it online. And I really think that using the analogy of not learning how to read in grade one online is very similar to all the things that are missing when someone is doing an online uh, rabbinic ordination program. So if the future of the rabbinate is not in online ordination, um, what would your personal prescription be? Like, what what do you think we're not doing as a community to increase this pipeline to back to where it was, where we're telling students, we're telling teens, uh, telling recent graduates of university, you should be considering rabbinical school because you actually would make an excellent candidate to be a rabbi in a community, to be doing all the other things that a rabbi could be doing. Um, what are we not doing right? And what do you think we should be doing? We're not doing that enough, right? So Sure. So, but that um, might not be enough. It's a start, though. Right? Sure. So I will be going to Camp Ramah for a week this summer. Uh, I got an email somewhere. You know, if you're going to a Camp Ramah this week and you or this summer and you see kids that are there that you think might be good, talk to them about it. Uh, that, that hasn't really been happening. So it really needs everyone that engages with young people to be ambassadors. Why does it mean that they would that they seem like they would be good in this? I don't context? know. Maybe their Judaism is authentic and they wear it on their sleeves. Maybe they are the prayer leaders. Maybe they're the ones that get up on the table and they know all the words to be a Hamazon, the the benching, the 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 grace after meals, and and they're just real. Or maybe they offer words of Torah with the parsha that connect to the world we live in, and it just comes out as an authentic voice. You know, a, a rabbi is is a teacher. A rabbi is a teacher, um, that same kid who now knows how to read. If you ask her what a rabbi says, she'll say a rabbi teaches Torah and lives Torah. She used to say a rabbi goes to meetings a lot. So we, we've got her to change that. Um, but a rabbi teaches Torah and lives Torah. Hi, Rabbi Friar Bonds, and I'm, I'm Zach, the producer. Um, I wanted to jump in. Um, can you make the case for like why we need rabbis? And my my frame is that a lot of the Jewish experiences that I have today are, if they're prayer experiences, they'll be sort of like an independent minyan, they'll be like a chavura, they'll be a bunch of people gathering together to um, sing or do a, a, do a Jewish ritual, and it's all lay-led. So, yeah, what, what do you think a, a, an official rabbi brings to the ritual experience that uh, may not be possible for a community of lay-led people? Say you find a something on your skin, and you're kind of looking at it, and you're like, hmm, I wonder what that is. And then you say to your partner or your friend, I have this thing on my skin, and I don't know what it is. And your partner or your friend says, well, I think it could be this. But you want to go to a doctor. You're going to go to a dermatologist to find out what that thing really is on your skin. Well, if it's OHIP, you might have to wait for a while for that referral. But anyway, go on. <laughs> oh, I thought I, I thought you'd go with this one. OK, no, uh, no, I, I like it. Please continue. This, so as a rabbi, in addition to teaching Torah and being Torah, I'm in the business of raising Jewish families from from the beginning to the end. And we'll see this on Shavuot when on the first day of Shavuot, We'll be blessing all of the babies who have been born in the past year, whose parents feel safe to bring them to shul, as like in Bikurim, the first fruits. And then on the second day of Shavuot, I'm going to give the Yisker sermon, right? Bir birth to death. That's what we do. There's a whole lot of Jewish families out there who don't have the skills and don't know basics, intermediate, or even advanced knowledge about Judaism. Um, and just like they could ask their friend for the first question, what is that thing on my skin? Um, but when it comes time for the harder questions, they'll still want to ask a rabbi because we have the training. 
you know, we go to school for a really, really, really long time. And hopefully most of us continue in continued education and continued learning throughout our entire career. Can I ask you, Phoebe, and put you on the spot? Um, are there Is it moments- about, If it's about dermatology, I might actually know the answer because we've been to a lot of the uh, pediatric dermatologists. <laughs> okay. Yes, go on. No, um, the, um, if I had to ask you right now, and again, clearly the answer could change, but what would be a role uh, that you would say to yourself, oh, I think I need to call a rabbi about this? Uh, as, a, as a secular Jew living in I lots of cannot, Dallas. The only time I could imagine at ever being necessary is if for some reason we all were planning to move to Israel and I needed to prove that I was Jewish for that. That's the only thing that I could imagine. Yeah. I, mean, I do those are, letters yeah, all the time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're, for them. We're, as, as I've mentioned, we're, we're renovating our kitchen, so we're not emigrating anywhere anytime soon. But, but that's what I would think of is where you would need a rabbi in a life like mine. In terms of what Phoebe just said, uh, how much of your job do you think do you spend uh, talking to people either about theological questions or halakhic questions uh, versus things like things like that? Uh, the letter for Israel, sort of organizing those life cycle events. Yeah, I'm curious to know how much of it is is pastoral care and how much of it is more quote unquote administrative not that the not to not to poop on the administrative and all of the important things about being a facilitator and a community leader but i'm just curious about from the more um yeah the theological or spiritual guidance you ask fantastic questions by the way um so i first of all i'm fortunate that i have an assistant who helps me out with a lot of the administrative stuff i just end up signing my name and we have forms but here at Bethsedek, we have six core values care, connect, pray, learn, celebrate, and give and get. And, you know, we look at this all the time. My top two are care and connect. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, I also have an MSW. So a lot of the work that I do is pastoral, and I'm grateful for that. I really do what I love. And I go to Minion almost every single day, multiple times a day. And I teach classes. And I'm there on the Bima for celebratory experiences. And I'm at weddings all over the city, you know, sometimes even outside the city uh, for celebratory experiences. And every now and then I get involved in uh, development and fundraising. But to answer your question directly, care and connect are my top two areas. And I'm purposely here in the synagogue because that's the skill set that I bring. And that's where I shine. What would your final message then be to uh, your, the graduating class, right? The grade 12 of every Jewish uh, kid in Ontario right now and the rest of Canada. Um, what's your 60 second pitch to convince some of them to like go and consider the rabbinate as a not only viable career, but as a desirable career? The rabbinate is desirable because you'll never be alone. You'll always be with people, whether they are the people that you serve or your colleagues. Shabbat if you want it to be Shabbat, will be Shabbat for you. Yeah, you got to go to shul in the morning, but that afternoon nap, oh, it's the best part of, of your week. And if Torah is important to you and learning Torah is important to you, that's something that you'll be able to do multiple times a week as part of your job. And hopefully you'll be able to go to sleep at night every single day, knowing that you made a difference in someone's life. Couldn't have said it better myself. Robin, it's been uh Wonderful talking to you. Uh, will you stick around and do some nachos with us? Absolutely. Excellent. Um, so if you want to know more about Robin, if you want to meet her, go to Shul at Beth Sedek in Toronto. Rabbi Robin fry Bryson, thank you for coming on Bonjour Chai. Thank you so and- much for coming on. This was so interesting. This has been a lot of fun. I'm really, really excited that we made time to make this happen. And now it's time on our show for our nachos of the week. Rabbi Robin, get us started. Right after Pesach. I was the spiritual leader for the Toronto delegation of March of the Living. And because I was not a chaperone who was assigned to a bus, I got to float. And I also spent a lot of time with the five survivors who traveled with us. I really got to know them and you know, hold their hands, you know, go through airports with them. And one of our survivors is a wonderful man named Saul Naiman. And we just made plans for my family to meet him and his wife in a couple of weeks. We we both impacted each other on such a really deep level. And I'm excited that uh, my daughter, who again is young, is going to meet someone who 
was in the Holocaust. And we'll see how we're able to uh, explain that to her. But I'm really, really excited that these relationships are continuing after the two weeks that we spent together. I love it. Phoebe, what's your novice this week? Well, I feel I feel like it's wrong in light of such a meaningful nachas and so profound. It's okay. Mine is so Holocaust floaty related, and um, fizzy. Because I'm just going to say, like, you know, what can I say? Um, I'm going to recommend an article on Curbed.com called How Much Does It Cost to Live Like This? We asked young New Yorkers about their dream futures. Then we calculated exactly how much each would cost. Um, one of the reporters, Rachel Sugar, um, I've just like dealt with it the past through journalism stuff, and she's really, really good. Um, it's just fascinating, um, a little glimpse at people's, um, at sort of like youngish adults' ideal lives, and then like the slightly older adults' um, actual lives and what it all costs in New York. And I learned that my life in Toronto is apparently the dream life of a 30 year old in New York, although it would also apparently cost about like 20 times more in New York. So that's my pitch to move to Toronto. <laughs> there you go. Um, so I read that article yeah. and I saw it also. And the it's first thing that came to mind when I saw these nine different profiles was, oh, if we did this with how much it costs to live as an observant Jew, um, the numbers would be like just as through the roof, just as preposterous. People have no concept of what it costs to actually live an observant Jewish lifestyle. I, I would love to see the numbers stacked up, you know, urban observant Jews or urban secular Jews, and you'll see that the numbers, the cost of living um, inevitably is that much higher. Your, our dollars go a, a lot less far. Um, but I found that fascinating anyways. My nachis is going to be a lot um uh, even even fizzier and airier than whatever it is that you just um, that, that that wonderful curbed article. Um, Gastronomica is a is a, it's called the Journal for Food Studies. It comes out from the University of California Press. It's an academic uh, uh, journal that I like and I've read off and on for probably fifteen twenty years ever since I found it randomly uh, in a in a magazine shop. And they put an article out uh, in the winter 2022 issue by James Edward Mallon called Give Us Seltzer That We May Drink, How Soda Water Became a Jewish Icon. And uh, it's an it's a wonderful academic uh, history, uh, like done in academic article style. Uh, it's a historical piece and about the rise of seltzer as a Jewish beverage and how and why it, it came to be that. And it's a fascinating read. I highly encourage everybody to go and check that one out. I had a lot of fun with it. Uh, Gastronomica is available online and or in magazine shops, I think. Can't and wait probably to read that. That sounds amazing. Libraries and stuff. Um, yeah, this was wonderful. Robin, thanks for coming on. Phoebe, always a pleasure. Thanks for having me. I really, really appreciate this opportunity to speak to the two of you and to see if what Phoebe looks like in real life. Thank you for listening to Mosher High for the week ending May 27th, Shavuot. This week is Shavuot. This weekend is Shavuot. The show is produced and edited by Zach Kaufman. The executive producer for CJN Podcasts is Michael Freeman. Our music is by So Called. We are a project of the Jewish Living Lab and are distributed by the CJN Podcast Network. You can listen to all our past episodes on our page at the cjn.ca slash bonjour, and you can subscribe to the podcast and automatically receive all episodes on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. We would love it if you told a friend about Bonjour Chai. It is one of the best ways we get new listeners. As always, you can email us with comments at bonjour at the cjn.ca. Yeah.